Good morning and welcome to Salem Chapel. We're so glad you're joining us today. We know getting connected to a new church can be hard. If you're new to Salem Chapel, or if you've been coming for a few weeks and are ready to take your next steps, we would love to make that as easy as possible. There are two ways we can help. First, if you're in person, stop by the Welcome Center on your way out of today's service. Or second, you can visit salemchapel.org slash hello at any point this week. After completing one of those steps, one of our staff members will follow up with you later this week to help you get connected here at Salem Chapel. College students, are you sticking around town this summer? You don't have to spend summer alone. We're meeting every other Tuesday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. for college night small groups. You'll be able to meet other college students, have some fun, and study God's word together. Visit salemchapel.org college to get plugged in. Parents, are you looking for some fun ways to spend time with your kids this summer? In Salem Kids, we have lots of fun events planned this summer, including movies on the big screen, outdoor hangouts, and more. Head to salemchapel.org kids to see the calendar. Each week, our middle and high schoolers gather to hang out, play games, worship, and spend time studying God's Word. We have a dedicated team of volunteers who want to help students understand how Jesus impacts their lives in normal, everyday ways. Starting on June 8th, we will be switching to our Thrive Summer Schedule, meeting Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. for Thrive Nights plus some fun events for teens. You can see the full calendar at salemchapel.org students. You can learn more about these events and everything else happening at Salem Chapel by visiting our website at salemchapel.org. Church, let's stand as we enter into a time of worship together. Well, welcome to Salem Chapel if you're new with us. Thank you so much for coming today into a place you've never been before. I know that's never easy. My name is Johnny Pereira, the privilege of being the lead pastor here. Uh, whether you call this place your home or you're brand new, we are glad that you're here. If you're watching us online, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We've got a lot to cover this morning, and we have been in a series uh, really uh, kicked off after Easter, just walking through this for many of us, very familiar passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, looking at the armor of God. And the title of the series is Weapons of War, really looking at the things that are described in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, but really looking at these things as, as these instruments, uh, to use that analogy that Paul uses, to, use, to look at these things as instruments that have been given to us by God to experience the victory that he has accomplished for us right here in the here and now. The subtitle to, that, to the series that we are in is How to Stand Firm in Your Battle. Because the reality is, is that many of us have walked in here and some of us have experienced victory in some things that, that we are in the midst of and others of us have maybe come in here defeated. And so it's just allowing God's word to answer that question that we may all be asking Maybe not in these words, but how do I stand firm in the battle that I am experiencing? And so Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, uh, the passage is on the screen. I'm not going to take time to read verses 10 through 16, but I want you to see them up there because we've walked through every one of these pieces of armor to use that analogy that Paul uses and so if you are brand new, I encourage you to go to our website. You can listen to the messages. You can hear how we've gotten to where we are today. But today what I want us to focus on is a very important weapon of war. And that is what's mentioned in verse 17 when Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation. The reason why he says take rather than put on, is not because we aren't supposed, supposed to put this on. But here's what's true. So many of us, when we go into the battle of our day, we forget to take the thing that is so important for us to have if we're going to fight against what the devil desires and his demons desire to bring upon our life, which is death, destruction, ruin. Jesus says it in John 10.10 10, that I've come to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is the enemy's plan for you. 
that whatever is good in your life, he wants to steal it from you, he wants to kill it, he wants to destroy it. And I think it's interesting that Paul says, take the helmet of salvation, because so often we forget to take it with us when we go into the battle. Here's what you need to understand just from a background standpoint. I didn't realize this when I was studying this passage of Scripture. This was new to me. Obviously, I knew that Roman soldiers wore helmets. The reason why we say Roman soldiers, if you're not familiar with this passage of Scripture, is because Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesians, while he was in prison in Rome. And so, obviously, Paul, being in prison in Rome, he would have seen Roman soldiers every day. Some believe that he was actually chained to a Roman soldier. So he just uses the armor that this Roman soldier has as an analogy of what we have been given in Jesus Christ to experience victory in the battles that we face in this broken, sinful, evil world that we live in. So something about the helmet that was interesting is there's, there were two types of helmets. Didn't really get any concept of when one would be worn versus another, but there were two types. There was the Galea helmet made of, of like a leather not to give the idea that that leather didn't offer protection, but that was one type of helmet. And then there was another type of helmet called the cassis, which was a metal type of helmet, which would have been a helmet that would have looked more like this helmet. But regardless of what helmet you may have worn, the principle was the helmet protects your head, protects the thing that's most important. And Paul presents, gives this helmet as a metaphor for salvation, because after all, what does he say? Put, take up or take with you the helmet of salvation. So let me tell you what the helmet of salvation is, and I'm gonna, we'll talk about this throughout our time this morning. Here's what the helmet of salvation is. It is the assurance of who you are in Jesus Christ. To put it another way, if you're taking notes, it's the confidence that you have for who you are in Jesus Christ. That's the idea of the helmet of salvation. It's like I have confidence of who I am in Jesus Christ. Remember 2 Corinthians where Paul says, you are in Christ, therefore you are a new creation. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. Like you're not who you used to be before you came to Jesus Christ. Do you still struggle? Do you still battle with having to say yes to the Lord and no to your flesh? Absolutely, but you are a different person. There's confidence in that. I've been made a new creation. The significance of the helmet is this, because your mind, my mind, is what Satan desires to attack the most. You think about it right now. Where is the battle so often that we fight more than any other fight? And where do we fight it? Between your two ears. How you think. I read this this week, I thought this was good. It says, what the brain is to the body, the mind is to your soul. Do you know why this helmet was important and why Roman soldiers wore it? Because the reality is, is, is what, would, what would happen is, is if, if your brain is damaged, like let me get, it's been so fun for me to get different weapons to use as, as, as visual illustrations. It's amazing what you can buy on Amazon. Like, this is a legit sort. Like, that's a little unnerving that you can buy this on Amazon, but nonetheless, this is real. Like, this is metal. Not sharp here, but definitely sharp there. Lori was very worried when I unboxed this and started waving it around the house. But nevertheless, here's the, here's the significance of the helmet. Because this sword was called a broadsword. It's different than the type of sword that we're going to look at next week, Sword of the Spirit, which by the way, yes, I have a sword that I ordered for that as well. Um, <laughs> if anybody works at Amazon, I'm sending them back, so don't say anything, all right? Um, but it was a different sword. This sword was designed for one thing, to damage the head of your adversary. 
whether it was to cut it off, whether it was to smash it, whether it was to damage it severely so that that soldier would be rendered inactive. So what the helmet did is it, it, it protected the head, the brain. Why? Because what the brain is to the body, the mind is to the soul. See, I can have the strongest legs you can imagine and the strongest core and chest and arms and everything else and literally be this mighty warrior. But if I have brain damage in the battle and my brain is damaged, it doesn't matter how strong my arms are, my chest is, my core is, my legs are, my heart is, my lungs are, if the brain is damaged, it renders the rest of those things ineffective. As the brain is to the body, so the mind is to the soul. What's the soul? It's made up of your mind, which we're going to talk about a lot this morning. Your emotions, what you feel, and your will, what you do. But everything starts in the mind, how I think, because how I think affects what? It affects how I feel. In my mind, what I think affects what I do. So when, I, when we talk about the helmet of salvation, the significance of it is because we need to understand that the number one battlefield that the devil operates is against your mind, how you think. And what the devil wants to attack more than anything else in your life is your identity. What do I mean by identity? Who you believe yourself to be. If we were sitting across from one another, just me and you, and we're in a coffee shop, and, and it's a place that allows us to have substantive conversation, and I was to ask you, who do you believe you are? It's a pretty deep question, right? I want you to think about that. Today, who do you believe you are? So often, here's how we answer that. We answer that by what we do as a job, right? Well, I sell insurance. I'm a banker. I'm a teacher. I'm an entrepreneur. I work at a grocery store. I build houses. Whatever it may be. How do we answer that? I'm married. Who are you? Well, I'm married and I have this many kids. Who are you? Well, I was born in such and such a place and I have this many brothers or sisters or no siblings. I came from a loving home. My mom and dad are still alive or maybe... I came from a broken home and I don't know what it's like to be in a loving home and I was a foster kid and I went from foster home to foster home. I make this much money. Who are you? Man, I'm a person who longs to have a relationship. I'm a person who longs to have a child. See, how we answer that question is so important because it's tied to your identity. And it's the number one battlefield that the enemy does his work. So when we talk about the helmet of salvation, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the confidence that a believer has in who they are in Jesus Christ. You know another way to say that? The helmet of salvation is your identity in Jesus Christ. Who you see yourself to be because of Jesus' love for you. That's what we're talking about this morning. See, too often, here's what happens. We view our salvation as followers of Jesus Christ as something completely in the future. If I was to say to you, think about salvation you know what most of us, 99% of us would think of? I have a home in heaven. So if I die today, or Jesus comes back before I die, I know I'm going to heaven. Praise God for that. That's an amazing reality. I am not minimizing that at all. But sadly, 
the vast majority of us, when we think of our salvation, even when we read it, the helmet of salvation, we think to ourselves, that's something in the future, but I have no idea how that impacts what I'm feeling right now. I have no idea how that impacts what I'm battling in my mind and thinking right now. I have no idea how that impacts what I'm gonna do or what I'm not gonna do. I have zero idea. And the sad thing is, is that is an indictment on how we disciple or how we have discipled in the church. Because what Paul is talking about in the helmet of salvation is not so much about eternity in the future. What he's talking about with this helmet of salvation is how the salvation makes an impact Right now, in this present day, in the battle that you're facing, he's literally talking about how does Jesus make a difference in your everyday life. So when we look at this helmet of salvation today, understand this, he's not talking about your eternity with Jesus, though praise God for that. He talks a lot about that in other places. He's talking about how does your salvation make an impact in your identity, in the here and now. So that as a follower of Jesus Christ, when someone says, who are you? When our temptation is to answer that by what we've accomplished or what relationships we have or what things we don't have that we think we should have, we can say, no, 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 that's not what I define myself as. I define myself, I have confidence in knowing that I am a child of God who is loved by God, who has a heavenly father who loves me in ways that my earthly father couldn't, no matter how good he was or how sinful he was. That's what Paul is talking about. See, the title of the message this morning, if you're taking notes, is this, Your Helmet of Salvation. And what I hope when we walk out of here today is that we would have a growing appetite and desire to take our identity in Jesus and to want to grow in how we apply that to the thoughts that so often are coming at us, that want to cause us to want to define ourselves by something other than that we are loved by Jesus Christ. See, here's the idea I want you to get today. Your helmet of salvation is the confidence that your identity as a person is in Jesus Christ. That is the helmet of salvation for you. That I have confidence that my identity as a person is in Jesus Christ. I want us to pray here in a moment because I know that this is something that we battle with every day. And so here's what I want you to do. I'm just gonna give us a moment of silence and I want you to pray this to the Lord. I want you to pray first of all, Lord, would you show me where I've been wrong in my thinking? And the second part, Lord, would you begin to show me how who you say I am is what defines me? Let me just give you a moment to pray that, and then I'm going to pray. Lord, every one of us want to belong, we want to be accepted, we want to believe we have value. Lord, those are longings of our heart that you place there. But so often, Lord, I'm guilty and we are guilty of looking 
to so many other things that can really never satisfy those longings. Lord, maybe some in here have never viewed their salvation as something that's applicable today, not just for their future. But God, what you have given us is a precious thing. To not only enjoy heaven with you for all of eternity, but Lord, to live with confidence in an identity that Lord, though we don't deserve it, though there's nothing that we can do to earn it, Lord, it is a gift that protects our minds from being beaten down and smashed in with thinking that does not come from you, but comes from the devil and his demons who desire to render us ineffective. But Lord, I thank you that you have won the victory for us. So Lord, may we, as we walk through this series, but Lord, as we continue to be discipled, to abide with you, that Lord, we would also see that you have given us these things and discipleship is learning how to fight. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I want you to picture with whatever is waging on your mind right now and how you're wanting to find yourself, I want you to think about when you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Because every piece of this armor has been given to us in the moment of our salvation. For to use that analogy that Paul uses. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation for today, not just in the future. Look at next week, God's word that's described as the sword of the spirit, the ability to talk to God through prayer. All of these things have been granted to us. That's why it says in 2 Peter, all things have been given to a follower of Jesus Christ that pertain to life and godliness But I don't think we view it like this, like literally what the Lord is doing is he's saying, I'm going to give you my helmet of salvation and I'm going to place it on your head at the moment that you trust Christ. And I want you to remember every day that you are not defined by what people say about you. You're not defined by what you achieve. You're not defined by what you don't achieve. You're not defined about what upbringing you had. You're not defined about where you live. You're not defined by what anyone else says about you. But I want you to understand that I am placing this helmet on you so that when those thoughts come, you have something to combat them. And that is that you are a child of God who is loved by me before the foundations of the world, that I have called you from darkness into marvelous light. You are mine, and no one can take that from you. That's the idea. That's the idea. So I just want to say that before we get into to, to the rest of this today, because what I want to do is I just simply want to give you five ways that your identity in Jesus protects your mind from the attacks of the enemy, because we will be attacked. And you're going to face every day that you're not good enough. You're going to face every day that you're not forgiven. You're going to face every day that God can't be trusted. You're going to face the temptation every day that life is hopeless. So let's look at the ways that your identity in Jesus protects your mind from the attacks of the enemy. Here's the first way. Just mention this. Satan attacks your mind to think you're not good enough. I know I've been doing this over 20 years. There are the majority of us in this room that are battling this thought. But your identity in Jesus, what does it say there? It says his power is made perfect through your weakness. I'm giving you a passage of scripture for every one of these. So if one resonates with you more than the others, then I want you to write this passage of scripture down. And here's what you need to do this week. You need to print that out. You need to put it as a, as a wallpaper on your phone, as a screensaver on your computer. Put it on your dash. Put it wherever you'll see it, on your fridge, on your mirror, wherever. Because we're gonna give you some passages of scripture that speak to your identity in Jesus Christ that can combat the lies of the enemy that literally are thrown at you, that literally want to bash your spiritual head in. 
2 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, says this, when I want a battle that I'm not good enough. Let's jump down to verse 8. Paul speaking of this thorn that we don't know what it is that is coming to his life. In verse 8 it says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But look at what the Lord says to him. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, look at his perspective. I'm content with my weaknesses, with insults, with hardships, with persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now look at verse 10 again. What so often do we want to allow to tell us that we're not good enough? Weaknesses. Insults. Maybe you've had someone throw something at you today and it was just, it was just evil, like it wasn't constructive criticism, it was just nasty. And you're like, man, it's just, I'm not good enough. Hardships. Man, I just lost my job and it just makes me feel like I'm not good enough. Persecutions. Something's coming to my life. Maybe it's a sickness or an illness and our mind wants to go to, well, I guess God doesn't, Maybe I did something and God's brought this on in my life and calamities, things that are out of our control. Every one of those things wants to do what? Is used by the enemy to get us to think, I'm not good enough. And we react a myriad of ways to those thoughts. But listen to me, what Paul understood is it's in that moment that there's opportunity. Because in that moment, there's an opportunity for me to press in more to understand the power that's found in my identity. And Paul understood that in those moments of weakness, I'm not asking myself all the time, why is this happening, why is that? No, this is an opportunity to realize the strength that is found in my salvation for today and how I think about myself So often we view our insecurities as something that is negative. And I would say this, that our insecurities become something negative based on what we choose to do with them. Those moments of weakness. But our insecurities or our weaknesses are an invitation from God to combat the false beliefs about who we are. Because what do we do? We define ourselves by what we do or what we haven't done, don't we? That's why so often when someone asks you, hey, tell me something about yourself, what do we automatically go to? What we do. But our insecurities, our weakness, are an invitation from God to come back to false beliefs about who we are and find true peace and contentment in who we are because of Jesus. Your insecurities, my insecurities, you know what they are? They are cries of my soul for identity. Cries of our soul to belong, to be accepted. Well, if I just, if I do just do what this, this person, you know, they, they've criticized what I'm, what I'm doing or, or it never seems, you know, they're always offering criticism. So what do we do? We come be a slave so to speak, to that person's opinion. And so we, we try everything to make them happy and we bend over backwards to make them happy or we're constantly looking for people's approval. So we're just literally a chameleon and oh, oh, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do to get acceptance from you? Okay, I'll do that. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do? Okay, I'll do that. Oh, this, th- this is who I need to say I am? Okay, I'll do that. Why? Because we have a core desire to want to belong and to be accepted. But if in those moments of insecurity, I remind myself, wait a minute, let me make sure that I'm taking my helmet of salvation in those moments and remind myself 
that in those moments of insecurity, I can remind myself, wait a minute, I'm not defined by, by who you say I am, or I'm not defined about, about whether you think I'm good enough, or I'm not defined about whether the circumstances affirms whether or not who I think I am, and whether I'm good enough or I'm not good enough. No, no, no. I'm defined by Jesus Christ. In that moment of weakness, is an opportunity for me to grow into that reality. Because here's what I've learned. If I'm feeding my insecurities on your approval or what the culture tells me, if I do this or if I say this or if I agree with that or whatever it is, then somehow, then, then, then I'm a part of something. Here's what I've found. If I'm feeding my insecurities and my mind on who I say I am, on anything other than Jesus, I have an appetite that will never be quenched. I can tell you you're awesome till I'm blue in the face. But if you're looking for my approval, it's never going to be enough. If you're looking for your spouse's approval, it's never going to be enough. Cheryl looks at If you're looking for your kid's approval, it's never going to be enough. If you're looking for your boss's approval, it's never going to be good enough. Why? Because the only thing that compats that thought that I'm not good enough is to remind myself that Jesus loves me. He loved me when I was unlovable. He loved me in the midst of my sin. See, number one, Satan attacks your mind to think you're not good enough, but your identity in Jesus says his power is made perfect through your weakness. Here's the second way that your identity in Jesus protects you from the enemy's attacks on your mind. Secondly, Satan attacks your mind to think you can't be forgiven, but your identity in Jesus says it is finished. We walk through the book of John starting last October, and we dealt with this passage in John 19, verse 28, but I want to point your attention to it again. If you're struggling with being forgiven by the Lord, then this is two verses for you. John 19, verse 21, it says, after this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished, everything that was necessary for Jesus to accomplish, to forgive your sin is the idea. What did Jesus say? He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the spirit. So many times when we do something that, yes, is sinful, we hurt someone else. Maybe we do something that we never thought we were capable of doing. We thought to ourselves at one time, I'll never do that, and we ended up doing that. But we responded to the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings on our, on our behalf. We repented of that sin. We've asked forgiveness of that sin. But what so often happens even after that, man, the devil loves to wave his broadsword and put thoughts into our mind. You can't be forgiven from that. Look at what it did. You can't be forgiven, and it's in that moment that I choose. Wait a minute, I have an identity in Jesus Christ, and he doesn't define me by what I have done in terms of sin. He defines me that Jesus Christ on my behalf said it is finished. So I want you to think about whatever you're struggling with right now, and you're like, I cannot forgive myself. And I want you to hear Jesus' very words on that cross where he said, for that sin that you're struggling with right now, and he said, it's finished. Let me give you one more verse. If you're struggling with this, Psalm 103, 10 through 12, where it says, he, speaking of God, does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repays us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. It doesn't say those who've sinned because we'd all be in trouble. It says, no, no, no. Those who are reminding themselves and have a reverence for who God is and what he's accomplished for them. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. 
I believe that oftentimes we struggle believing we can be, get, be forgiven of the things of our past that bring us shame, and we all have them. I have them. You have them. But I believe we struggle so often and aren't able to let those go because we believe there's something we still need to do to pay penance for the things that we've done. It can't be that easy, Johnny. But I don't know about you, but I wouldn't call what Jesus did for me easy. See, if there was nothing to earn my salvation, but it came as a gift, then part of that gift is not just my salvation for all of eternity, but it's also forgiveness for the sins that I've committed. Because if you're thinking that there's something that you need to do as penance, to truly be forgiven by the Lord, then listen to me, if that was the case, then why did Jesus do what he did? And not only that, but if there's something that I can do to somehow be forgiven, like yeah, it's Jesus plus my penance, then that means there's something that I can do to lose my identity in Jesus Christ. So this morning, if the sword of the devil is pounding at you that you can't be forgiven, oh, friend, bring yourself back to these passages of Scripture to remind you that Jesus said, it is finished. Here's the third thing, the third way that our identity in Jesus protects us from the attacks of the enemy on the way that we think. Satan attacks your mind to think you can't change. But your identity in Jesus says the Holy Spirit is committed to do the work that Jesus started in you. You struggling to believe that you can change? You struggling with that? Because Philippians 1.6 says this. Paul says this. I am sure of this. Like There is no doubt in my mind that this is true, is what he's saying. He's sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Some of you who actually have Bibles with ink on them need to write above there your name. Now, if you're techie enough to real, figure out how you can do that on your iPad or your phone, then knock yourself out. I am sure of this, that in the moments when the enemy wants to wave his sword and come at the way that I think and say, Johnny, you can't change. What does that helmet say? I am sure of this. That he who begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus started the work in me at my salvation. That's Ephesians 2. I was dead in my trespass and sins, but God made me alive, Ephesians 2, 4. God who is rich in love and his great mercy. Like there was nothing that I could do to earn my salvation. There was nothing that I could do to realize that I needed it. No, God opened my eyes. He, he allowed me to see that I needed his salvation. I accepted it. And so the work that Jesus started at my conversion will be completed until I see Jesus Christ. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit and it's impossible for me not to change if I'm not a follower of Jesus. See, some of us have been like, man, I have no idea how salvation impacts my here and now. We're talking about it right now. Some of you have wrestled with these thoughts and been chained by these thoughts for years. And what the Lord, the reason why the Lord has you in this room or watching today is because he doesn't want you to live a defeated life. He's saying, take your helmet. Put it on. Stop defining yourself by something else and realize that I'm committed to do the work in you even in the times that you're not. And unfortunately, I love to tell you that 
This change happens overnight. And some people have stories and they're like, you know what, I, can't, I trusted Christ and boom, all of these desires were completely removed and that's amazing and I don't doubt those people's stories at all. But others of us are like, man, you know what change is? Me walking with the Lord and continuing to confess things that need to be confessed and continuing to submit to things that I see in his word. You know how oftentimes it is? One degree of transformation at a time. And so often we think of change as these monumental things, and sometimes that can be the case. But you know oftentimes what it is? It's a day by day submitting to the Lord. It's the small things. It's become more and more aware of my weaknesses. More and more aware of what's driving what I do. And in the midst of that, submitting that to the Lord. It's the slow change that if I've got a temper and little things set me off, it's that slow change to say, man, what's really driving my anger? Let me think about that. If I can't figure it out, let me talk with someone who's gonna point me to God's word and help me figure it out. So in those moments when I, when I wanna get upset, I'm like, you know what, I'm really not upset about that. Here's what's really, I'm really battling within my soul. It's in those moments The greatest work of change begins to take place. It's that whole Chinese bamboo tree idea. I've used this as an illustration before. Remember the Chinese bamboo tree, if you were with us when we talked about that? And that for five years, you never see anything break through the ground. But after five years, all of a sudden, a shoot comes through the ground. And that Chinese bamboo tree will grow 35 inches in one day. Was it that nothing was happening with the Chinese, Chinese bamboo tree? No, 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 no. What it was doing is all the work was happening underneath. The root system was being developed so that it would be strong enough to handle the heights that that Chinese bamboo tree would grow, which is over nine feet. Something was always happening. It just didn't happen at the pace that you thought it should. And that's so often so true in our walk with the Lord. We minimize the things that God may be doing in our life to change us, even though we're like, no, 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 I want you to change this. And what he's saying is, no, 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 you need to understand that I'm developing a root system in you that's gonna make you strong, that's gonna produce life change in you, it's not about behavior modification. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do that. And then after a while, yeah, you know what? I, I did that and it didn't work. No, no, no. We're talking about root system. That's why in Ephesians 3 it says, Paul says that I want you to be rooted and grounded in love. I want you to grow in your understanding of what is the length and height and breadth and depth of God's love for you. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. So when Satan wants to tell you you can't change, you say, devil, here's what I believe is true in God's word, that the Holy Spirit is committed to do a change in me that I can't do in myself. Here's the fourth way that your identity in Jesus protects you. Satan attacks your mind to think, you, God, you can't be trusted. But your identity in Jesus says all of God's promises are yours because of Jesus. You don't have any promises to cling on to without Jesus. Jesus is the reason why today we can say that God's promises are true. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not allow your mind to be conformed to this world. Do not allow your mind to have its, to allow the society and the culture that we live in to place its mold on you, to conform you to think that the way that society thinks is the way that we should think. If that's the case, you're going to be thinking different every year. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. And then it says in, in Romans 12 too, that by testing... That by me being in God's word, by me talking to the Lord, by me investing in the relationship that I have, what will happen over time, my mind will begin to see God's will as good, as perfect. The idea is something for my best. 
Man, the enemy wants to wield his sword and say, God, you, you can't trust him. But in those moments, I got to say, Jesus, if you loved me enough to live and to die and be risen, then whatever this situation is, God, I can trust you in that as well. Here's the last thing. Satan attacks your mind, my mind, to think that life is hopeless. But your identity in Jesus is the sun that shines hope in the darkest of times. If you're sitting here this morning and you're hopeless, first of all, man, I'm so sorry of whatever it is that has entered your life. I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that empathy. But if you're a child of God, you need to know that it's not hopeless. Because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's given you an identity. And that identity is the sun that shines hope in the darkest of times. See, if that's you, what you need to remind yourself of is this great passage of Scripture in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, which, by the way, can we just say is written by good old Peter, the one that denied Jesus? You're telling me he didn't know what it was like to feel hopeless? The same Peter that said, well, I guess I can't do this. I guess I can't change. I guess I'm not good enough. I guess I can't be forgiven. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to what I did before. And what does Jesus do after the resurrection? We talked about this in Je- when we walked through John as well. He tells his disciples, make sure you bring Peter. And Jesus shows up at the shore. And what does he do with Peter? He makes him a charcoal fire, the same fire type of, of fire that Peter denied Jesus at. And he makes another one. And he tells Peter, Peter, I love you. Do you love me? Peter, and he reminds Peter and he recommissions Peter to the mission that God has given Peter to do. Peter is martyred for his faith. Peter knows what it's like to struggle with feeling hopeless. And he says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's called us to be born again to a living hope. Not a dead hope, a hope that's rooted in circumstances that come and they go. A hope that's rooted in something that, yeah, may work for a season, but eventually our hearts will get dull with it and we'll look for something else. No, 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 this is a living hope, a lasting hope. Where is it found? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Listen to me. Anything that my heart longs for, that my soul longs for, that my mind wants me to think and bring me greatest satisfaction, it cannot be described as imperishable. It cannot be described as undefiled. It cannot be described as unfading. And it for sure can't be described as being eternal. Even good things. But my living hope can, my identity can, verse six, in this you rejoice. In this you rejoice. We don't have time to read the rest of the verses, but it says we rejoice that even when we're facing battles, here's what happens. Our understanding of our identity in Jesus, that living hope, it grows. And as we face more battles, here's what happens. We grow in how we're able to allow this helmet of salvation to protect us from the blows that the enemy wants to bring. I close with this. How many of you were alive in 1988? Raise your hand. That's what I thought, about 50% of the crowd. So you're gonna have to stick with me on this. In 1988, there was a boxing match between two individuals, Michael Spinks, Versus Mike Tyson. How many of you remember that fight? Raise your hand. Okay, even less of you. Great. It's going to be a great, very impactful illustration for all of you, I guess. <laughs> but what I thought was so interesting, because I remember, like, I was a little kid, but I remember, like, so wanting to watch this fight, and for whatever reason I can't remember, I couldn't. But Michael Spinks was 31-0 and 0 when he went into this fight. 
But this was Michael Spink's face when he went into this fight. Can we see that? Can we see that picture? I don't know about you, but that is not a face that says, I'm pretty confident going into this fight. Not at all. Now contrast that with Mike Tyson, who was 35-0 and 0 with 31 knockouts. Hadn't lost either. That's his face. Much different than the face of Michael Spinks. Now, if you watch this fight, you already know what I'm about to say, but for the vast majority of you that obviously have not, I have no idea what's going wrong with you, but if you were alive anyway. But you know how long that fight lasted? I've got some pictures of how this fight went. 91 seconds. Like, if you play, paid the pay-per-view that night, like, uh, that was an expensive 91 seconds. What's interesting, I didn't realize this until I actually was thinking about this fight, and I was like, I wonder if that was the shortest fight that Mike Tyson ever fought, and this was shocking to me. It actually wasn't. In 1986, he had a fight that lasted 30-some seconds. But why do I show these pictures? Why do I reference this fight that I guess I had no idea, but the majority of you never saw, never knew about? It's because of how... Michael Spinks versus Mike Tyson went into that fight. See, it's obvious by Mike Tyson's face. Can we put that up there again? That is not a face of someone who believes that they are going to lose. Can we put Michael Spinks up there? That is a face of someone who believes they're going to lose. And so often we as followers of Jesus Christ have that face. That's our face. That's your face today. Because you're allowing someone or something to define you. When your identity in Jesus Christ, the helmet of salvation, is supposed to give you this face, the face of Mike Tyson. Now let me not, let me make a caveat here because I'll feel guilty if I don't. In no way else do you need to emulate Mike Tyson other than having that face. (laughs) And I love Mike Tyson as a fighter. Not the greatest person when it comes to how you live your life. But we don't, we so mistake confidence with arrogance. The Apostle Paul was one of the most confident Christians that we have. Was he sinful? For sure. Was he imperfect? For sure. Is Jesus Christ the hero of our story and the Bible? Absolutely. But listen to the confidence of Paul. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9 says, we, all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, are afflicted in every way. It's like, let's not pretend that we don't live in a broken, sinful, evil world. And we experience sin done to us, and we do sin to others. That's our reality. We live in a sinful world, and praise God, that will not always be the case when Jesus comes back. But look at what he says. But we're not crushed. We're perplexed. God, why in the world is this happening? I don't get it. But we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted. There may come times that we're going to have to take a stand for things and it's not going to be popular, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down. There's going to be some things that come into our life that we don't desire them, that we don't ask for them. The man, it's going to bring us to our knees. But we're not destroyed. Verse 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self, our identity is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The strength that Paul had, do you hear it there? Like I can be shipwrecked, I can be stoned, I can be uh, misinterpreted, I can be viewed as this is all about me and not about the gospel, all the things that Paul encountered. But he was like, here's where my confidence is rooted. It's not rooted in the circumstances that I experience and it's not rooted in the interpretation that people may have about me. My confidence 
is found in the helmet of my salvation. That is what guards my mind. That is what I allow to speak to those thoughts that want to wage war in my brain. So you know what we need to do today? We need to take it up. We need to put it on. We need to strap it around our chin and pull it down over our ears and say, Lord, you've given me everything to fight. And I don't fight in my own strength. I fight in the strength that you have given me through the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. I would love to tell you that I can give you five little formulas or some pill to take that can help battle the way that you think, but it doesn't work that way. You know how it works? And I've experienced this and will continue to grow in this till I see Jesus. You know how it happens? It happens by me getting alone with the Lord, abiding with him and saying to the Lord, Lord, right now I'm struggling. I'm struggling to believe that I'm good enough. I'm struggling to believe that I can be forgiven. I'm really struggling to believe that you can be trusted in this. Man, it seems hopeless right now. It's telling the Lord what is heavy on your heart. It's telling those thoughts out loud to him. It's saying, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, I need you to help me see today that I'm loved by you. Can I tell you this? He will answer that prayer every time. So let's take it up. Let's put it on. And let's go fight. Would you stand with me this morning, Lord? We are thankful that as followers of Jesus, we are not defined by others' opinions of us. We are not defined by what we do to earn an income in this life. We are not defined by what relationship we have or what relationship we do not have. We are not defined by our past, but Lord, we are defined by your love for us. It's unconditional, it's undefiled, It is imperishable and it is secure. It's locked away in heaven. No one can touch it. No one can steal it. No one can destroy it. May we put that on every day. In Jesus' name, amen.